Well, so next up we have Alex Tapscott. And Alex, Alex is a globally recognized writer, speaker, investor, and advisor focused on the impact of emerging technologies, such as blockchain and cryptocurrencies and business, society, and government. He's the co-author with Don Tapscott of the criti critically acclaimed non-fiction bestseller, Blockchain Revolution, How the Technology Behind Bitcoin and Other Cryptocurrencies is Changing the World, which has been translated into more than 15 languages. Let's give Alex a warm welcome, please. Well, thank you very much for that uh, warm introduction. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, that was an amazing speech that we just heard from Anne Kavukian. Um, I, I hope I'm not dating you, Anne, but Anne wrote a book in uh, 1995 called Who Knows? Safeguarding Your Privacy in a Network World that addressed many of the issues that we're all grappling with today. And it's amazing to see so many people in this room who are probably born after that book came out. Um, still thinking about these very important issues. And uh, they say there's nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And I believe that Anne's uh, forethought and, um, and thinking about this from the 1990s is finally finding its moment with blockchain technology. And I'm very excited about that. So thanks, Anne, again for that great speech. Thank you. This is a very important time in human history. Uh, we are entering into a new digital age. Some people call it the fourth industrial revolution. So just to give you a sense of where we're at, the first digital age brought us the mainframe, the computer. The second digital age brought us uh, mini computers, PCs. The third digital age brought us the internet, uh, the mobile web, and the cloud. And now we're entering into this period where technology is ubiquitous. It's part and parcel of our daily lives, of our, of our businesses, of our interactions with others, and it's deeply woven into our society. And there are lots of technologies that people discuss when thinking about this new era. In Toronto, uh, artificial intelligence is the technology du jour, as it is in a lot of parts of the world, and Canada is a global leader in AI. But there's actually one technology in particular that I think is going to help to animate this new world and also help to address and solve some big global problems, and that's blockchain, the technology behind cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and others. It's my belief that blockchain basically represents the second era of the internet and is going to have as great, if not a greater impact on business in the world than the first era. So let me explain what I mean by that. When you use the internet today to send and move and share information, you're not actually sending an original, unique, discrete thing. You're sending a copy and you're retaining an original. Now for most kinds of information, that's okay. In fact, it's one of the benefits um, of the internet. So if you send a message to one person, you can send the same message to someone else. If you put something on Twitter, it's available for all to see. If you make an entry into Wikipedia, it uh, democratizes access to information and that's a very powerful force. Except when it comes to things that have value, things like assets, money, or personal data, being able to send a copy and create a digital trail of breadcrumbs is actually a terrible idea. So when you send money to someone, so Mike, I'll use you because you're sitting front row. If I owe you $20, uh, you're welcome, by the way, um, for something, it's important that when you receive it that you have the only version of that $20. And I can't send the same $20 to someone else. Because if I can copy money or assets the way I can copy information, then those assets become worthless. So it's great to have a printing press for information, but it's not so great to have a printing press for money or for assets. And this is a very particular problem which computer scientists have been trying to resolve, the double spend problem. How do you ensure that when you move something of value online that you aren't retaining a copy? And it applies not just to financial assets like stocks and bonds or monetary assets like money. It applies to everything from titles and deeds to intellectual property, even votes in an election. Because a vote is a lot like a payment, right? If you vote in an election, it's important that your vote is cast, that it's counted, that it remains anonymous, but that you also can't vote over and over again. Because if you could do that, then of course the system would be compromised. So as a result, even though the internet has created lots of value in how we access and share information, it actually hasn't had as big an impact on commerce. And it's had some very specific downsides like the uh, compromising of individual privacy. So because 
we're sending copies online, we basically still need to rely on middlemen, intermediaries, who sit in the center and perform a bunch of important roles. So these intermediaries, the traditional kinds, are familiar to many. You have financial intermediaries, banks, brokerages, you have governments. But increasingly, the big arbiters of our global economy are actually digital conglomerates and large technology platforms, companies like Google and Facebook and others. And they sit in the middle and they perform some important tasks. So in the case of sending money, they ensure that the buyer and the seller are connected to each other. They create trust. Uh, they perform business logic like clearing and settling and contracting and record keeping that basically makes the economy work. And overall, they do an okay job, but they have some very specific limitations. The first is that they're all centralized. And anything that is centralized is vulnerable to hacking or to attack or to fraud. And we see this with regularity in almost every single industry. The second big issue is that they slow things down and they add friction. So in a lot of different industries, in order to move value or information securely between parties, you have to rely on a number of different intermediaries. If you go down to Starbucks and tap your card on the card reader, you may think that the value is moving from you to the merchant, but it's not. It's going through about four or five different intermediaries. Your bank, the merchant's bank, a payment system, a risk management company, a credit card network, et cetera. And these frictions uh, slow down the economy and extract value. The third big issue is that they exclude big parts of the population. So there are billions of people in the world that don't have access to basic financial services. And a big part of that is because they don't have an identity. They don't have a way to prove who they are. And without that, they can't access the kinds of basic banking services that we take for granted. And the fourth big issue, and one of the key themes of this event, and one thing that Anne talked about uh, in her lucid remarks earlier, is that they compromise our privacy. So most of the data is extracted by intermediaries. And that's problematic for a few reasons. It means, number one, we can't necessarily use that data to organize our affairs. Uh, number two, it means that we can't monetize that data. It's worth a lot of money. If you look at the market capitalization of the biggest companies in the world, companies like Google and Amazon and others, they're worth hundreds of billions of dollars, sometimes upwards of a trillion dollars. They're built on an empire of user data, so we know that these things have value. And third of all, it means that our privacy could be compromised, either unintentionally um, or intentionally. So what if the internet were entering a second era, from an internet of information to an internet of value? built on this new technology platform called the blockchain. So for the first time in human history, individuals can move and store and manage assets, transact, do business, and communicate peer-to-peer -peer without the need for an intermediary. Now, blockchain technology started with Bitcoin, right? The first cryptocurrency. Now, Bitcoin was designed to be something relatively straightforward, basically cash for the internet, a way to move value peer-to-peer -peer without an intermediary. And what was fascinating about Bitcoin, really, is that it worked. And it worked so well that it's set off this spark and has caught the imagination of developers, entrepreneurs, business leaders, uh, people in government, regulators, central banks, and everybody in between, people like yourselves. So we call blockchain the trust protocol. Actually, the trust protocol was the alternative title for our book, Blockchain Revolution, but they told us not to bury the lead. So let me explain um, what I mean by that. So, Today, we live in uh, an asymmetric relationship with the technology companies who provide services to us. And in a lot of ways, it's sort of like the old feudal model, where you're working the land, you're creating a lot of the value, and in the end, you get to receive a small portion of that value back in, in, the, in uh, the form of a free service. But it's the landowner, the um, landlord, that actually captures most of the value. And this is true not just in technology, but in banking, retail, and other key services. And what blockchain enables for the first time ever is a citizen-owned identity, a self-sovereign identity. So you, as an individual, should be able to control your virtual self. And that means that you decide how much information is shared with whatever party you're interacting with. I think um, Anne described this earlier in her talk. So you want to buy something online. It's not actually necessary most of the time that the merchant knows who you are. It's only necessary the merchant knows that they've got the money. If you go down to the coffee shop and buy a donut with cash, 
They don't ask you for your driver's license. The cash is enough to satisfy the payment. Cash is a bearer instrument. Either you have it or the merchant has it. So for payments, we have cryptocurrencies, which enable us to prove we have the money without having to divulge all this information about ourselves. Now, there are other kinds of examples. Let's say you want to get a loan from a bank, or you want to take out a life insurance policy. In those kinds of scenarios, you do have to provide more information because they need to understand your credit worthiness or you know, your habits or your age or what have you. But the point is that in those scenarios, you're providing informed consent. Those companies aren't going to third parties like Equifax um, to extract information about you. So this is a user-driven method. Now, what's fascinating about this whole discussion around privacy is that for a while, we were willing to make this sort of Faustian bargain. We get free services, we trade our data. And nobody really understood what was actually going on, but we realized that the utility of Google and Facebook and other uh, services was enough to justify it. And I think more recently, people have become aware of just how much they're giving up. And what's really fascinating to me is that the solution that a lot of uh, commentators are proposing is that governments step in. So if you'd ask someone in the 1930s if government stepping in to protect, protect user individual privacy or citizen rights was a good idea, they would think you were nuts. So there's a third option. We don't have to choose between corporate surveillance and government surveillance. We can choose a citizen-centric model, and that's possible with blockchain. What's also very interesting is that this enables new kinds of or, uh, models for organizing um, value, organizing assets, and organizing human behavior. And that means rethinking the deep architecture of many of our institutions. So this is a, an economist, his name is Ronald Coase. Um, he wrote a very important paper in the 1930s called The Theory of the Firm. And in this paper and in his subsequent work, he asked a deceptively simple question. He basically said, why do companies exist? Why do we have firms? His logic was basically, if the best way to organize assets and people and value in an economy is using the open market, then why isn't everyone inside of a company their own independent contractor? How come sales and marketing and manufacturing and logistics and procurement and HR aren't all bidding with each other in an open marketplace to discover the best price? And he said the reason and he won a Nobel Prize for answering it the way he did. He said, the reason is transaction costs. So long as it's cheaper to do something inside the boundaries of a firm, then that company will continue to grow. So in the early days of capitalism, companies like the Ford Motor Company or US Steel realized that they could become vertically integrated and do everything cheaper inside of the boundaries of the firm. So the Ford Motor Company didn't just make cars. They had a steel plant, they had a timber mill, they had a rubber plantation. The Ford plant in Dearborn, Michigan, just a few hours from here, took in raw material like steel and timber and out popped Model T Fords on the other end. Henry Ford realized that he could achieve economies of scale because transaction costs in an open market were prohibitively high. So the first era of telecommunications and digital technology helped to lower transaction costs. So all of a sudden, you could connect to individuals around the world, suppliers, you could offshore, you could outsource. And that eventually led to business webs, where companies became increasingly focused on what they did best, and they outsourced and offshored and partnered to do the rest. But if you look at the company today, and I'm not sure how many of you folks work at large corporations, maybe not many of you, but ask yourself, does RBC or TELUS or, you know, well, TELUS is a bad example because it's a relatively new firm. Does Bell or RBC look fundamentally different than they did 25 years ago or 50 years ago or 75 years ago? Not really. I mean, at the margins, um, they have, you know, used digital technology and disaggregated themselves a little bit, but they're basically very similar to what they look like in the past. And that's because while the first few eras of digital um, Innovation helped to lower certain transaction costs, like the cost of communicating, right? You could make a Skype call, or you could send an email to someone on the other side of the world, or the cost of search. You could find information online uh, much more easily than you could in the past. Those were beneficial, but they didn't do that much to the real transaction costs that keep entities bound together in this, into this artifact, this thing we call the firm. And those are the cost of contracting, the cost of negotiating and enforcing business agreements, and the cost of establishing trust. The cost of establishing trust between parties has not declined in the same way that the cost of moving information. If you wanted to make a Skype call in 1985, um, 
What I mean by that is a video conference call with someone on the other side of the planet. You probably wouldn't be able to. The, the technology didn't really exist. But if you could, you'd have to marshal the resources of the NSA and the CIA and NASA to do it. And now we can do it for free anywhere in the world from our mobile devices. If you wanted to send money overseas in the 1980s, you would have to go through uh, the Fed's ACH system or the SWIFT network. You would have to interact with banks and brokers and money changers and other entities, and it would have taken you a few days to move that value overseas. That system fundamentally is still in place for a lot of aspects of the financial world. So the cost of moving information has dropped a million fold. The cost of moving and storing value has dropped maybe only slightly. So what does it mean for our institutions? What does it mean for the firm if we can drop the cost of contracting and the cost of establishing trust and the cost of moving value in the same way that the internet dropped the cost of moving and storing information? Well, it would lead to completely new models for doing business. So we've developed this uh, taxonomy which was uh, originally appeared in the book and basically it identifies these two new uh, mechanism. So you have artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, smart contracts, basically self-executing code that mimics the logic of a business agreement, but with guaranteed execution, enforcement, and payment. So those are the two aspects. You combine these things, and you can create distributed autonomous enterprises or distributed autonomous organizations. Entities that perform many of the same roles as firms do today, but where they don't necessarily have employees or managers or assets or home offices or any of the traditional things that we associate with companies. What could those types of models enable? So a lot of these new business models are being developed on platforms. And what's fascinating here is that a lot of the value that is going to be created in this new era is going to be captured by the underlying platform itself. So let me explain what I mean by that. If you had the opportunity to invest in the internet uh, in 1993, you could own a piece of you know, TCP IP, you probably would have been wise to make that investment because that technology platform that is the internet today supports businesses that are worth trillions of dollars. But you couldn't own a piece of that technology. Whereas this time with blockchain platforms, you can actually be a stakeholder in the future of the economy. You can own a piece of the platform um, by investing in these Web3 platforms. So um, projects like Cosmos, which recently uh, launched about a month ago and yesterday enabled the transfers of its native token. Aeon, who's putting on this event. Ethereum, of course, I think everybody knows. Polkadot, um, another leading pro project. These are a few examples of some of these new kinds of platforms. So let's took a, take a look at a, a couple of industries specifically here. So um, this thing on the screen here, who knows what that is? Just say it out loud. Yeah, it's a Rube Goldberg machine. So a Rube Goldberg machine is this contraption that performs a bunch of steps, dozens of steps. The more, the better. And some of them are often completely unnecessary and quite ridiculous. And in the end, the machine solves a very simple problem, like it cracks an egg or it closes a door. This is basically the way that our financial industry works today, where if you're moving value across borders, you have to interact with many intermediaries. If you're buying something, you have to interact with many different intermediaries. If you're exchanging a financial asset, like a share in a company, the share still settles T plus three. It takes three days to settle. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, it settled T plus five. So we shaved two days off, right? Big deal. Every single step of the way in the industry, we are interacting with many different inter intermediaries. And that's true of every single aspect of what this industry does. Everything from moving value to storing value to accessing credit to exchanging financial assets to funding and investing new projects to how we insure against catastrophic risk and even to how we organize financial information in the form of accounting. So something like accounting is based on the concept of double entry bookkeeping. For every single transaction, it creates a debit and a credit and in the end, they must balance, which is why it's called a balance sheet. Um, and we're able to look and sort of analyze financial data on a quarterly, monthly, yearly basis, which is sort of odd. You know, other kinds of information we can access in real time. But if you go down to the audit department or the accounting department of a firm or an organization, you say, hey, what's going on? How are our finances? They say, I have no idea. Ask me in three months. So in the old way of doing things, we used to uh, analyze and compile financial data with the cycles of the moon rather than in real time. With blockchain, every single transaction creates a cryptographic record. 
And that cryptographic record can be used to compile financial information about a company in real time. So this is often called triple entry bookkeeping, right? So you have a debit and a credit, but you also have a third entry into a blockchain ledger, uh, which you can search and analyze and trust is accurate um, because it's recorded in that fashion. Decentralized finance is a concept that has gained traction. Uh, a lot of people, when they think about decentralized finance, they think about cryptocurrencies and crypto assets. And I think it's helpful to just do a quick um, recap of what crypto assets are and how they work. So if I were speaking to someone who wasn't familiar with blockchain at all, they would likely say, I've heard about that. It has to do with Bitcoin, right? But why are there a thousand other coins like Bitcoin? Surely one currency is all you need. In fact, the more currencies you add, the more friction you add. Look at our system today with national fiat currencies. And I would say that's probably accurate. But what's important is that amongst crypto assets, not all of them are currencies, right? A currency is a medium of exchange, a store of value, a unit of account. It's a way to transact um, and to purchase goods and services and to uh, store value. Things like Bitcoin, Monero, Dash, Zcash, they're currencies. They're designed to be currencies. But most of the other uh, assets that exist, the long tail of crypto assets, are something very different. Platform tokens like Aeon are the gas that help to run distributed applications on networks. So the more applications that get run, the more demand there is for the native token of that network, and thus, perhaps, the higher the value goes. Whereas in the old world, we'd be paying intermediaries every step of the way. Here, we're achieving trust on top of the platform. So the platform stands to gain. Utility tokens are native digital assets that exist within ecosystems of specific applications. Securities tokens, these would be tokens that represent shares or claims on financial assets, stocks, bonds, and other kinds of assets. Natural asset tokens, tokens that present a claim on a physical asset in the real world, a bar of gold, a barrel of oil, uh, a unit in a housing development, a condo, et cetera. Uh, crypto collectibles, these are unique digital assets. So eventually there will be 21 million Bitcoin. If you were to look at the shares of a specific company like Bell or IBM or what have you, you would see that there are different classes of shares, but there are millions of each of them. With a crypto collectible, each asset is unique. In the same way that a Van Gogh or Rothko or a, you know, Jackson Pollock is a unique asset, crypto assets are entirely, crypto collectibles are entirely unique. So there are marketplaces for art or for in-game purchases or for real estate or assets within virtual worlds which are growing exponentially and where NFTs or non-fungible tokens have an opportunity to uh, grow significantly. And then you have crypto fiat currencies and stable coins. So most stable coins are basically pegged to fiat currencies where you've got a dollar on reserve matching a dollar of crypto asset. But there are new methods uh, like MakerDAO that are trying to create a different system where you can maintain price stability without having to rely on an intermediary effectively collateralizing your assets. And I think ultimately the long-term end game here potentially is that a lot of governments will issue their own crypto fiat currencies. They'll look different from Bitcoin, but they'll have some of the properties of other crypto assets. I won't talk about this in too much detail. These are eight different um, basic blockchain business models which are enabled because of this technology. Um, the one I'll focus on is blockchain cooperatives because it's kind of topical. Um, last week or two weeks ago, Lyft went public at about $30 billion. And uh, in the next couple of weeks, Uber is going to go public at $100 billion. So companies like Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and TaskRabbit and these others are known as the, the sharing economy companies, right? And it's a nice notion, this idea that we all get together and we work together and we share in the value that's created. Um, but it's fundamentally untrue. A company like Uber is not successful because it shares. It's successful because it doesn't share. Uber is not a sharing economy company. It's an aggregator. It aggregates excess capacity, cars, drivers, people, you who take the cars around. And if it can capture a monopoly in a given market, all the better, because then it can control price. And ultimately, the $100 billion of value that could potentially be created by this Uber IPO is not shared by drivers and, and uh, by those passengers who take those cars. It's captured asymmetrically. Now, there's nothing wrong with that in principle. You know, venture capitalists risk money. Founders risk um, a lot to start businesses. They capture the upside. But there's nothing about this that makes it a sharing economy model. Now, ask yourself, what does Uber fundamentally do, though? I think it does basically four things. It uh, gives you a way to uh, establish identity, reputation, uh, contracting, and payments. 
So identity and reputation, you know, who's the driver, where is he, how many hours has he logged, what's his star rating, what kind of car does he have, et cetera. Uh, reputation, um, how many, what's his star rating, you know, how many hours has he logged, what is he known for, et cetera, what's his, rep, what's his track record on the uh, platform. Contracting, when you get in an Uber and, take, and get taken to where you want to go, you pay. Uh, if the driver cancels or if he gets in an accident, which actually happened to me in Miami once, you don't pay. Uber is an intermediary that's enforcing a business agreement between you and the driver without having to require any friction between the two of you. And the fourth thing is payments, built into the back end, Visa, MasterCard, Direct Debit, uh, et cetera, Interact up here in Canada. All four of those functions of what Uber does as a platform can actually be uh, simplified, if not entirely replaced, using blockchain. So imagine instead of having your Uber reputation being your only identity, you actually had a self-sovereign identity that was made up not just of your track record on this one platform, but of your other interactions in life. That kind of information could allow you to authenticate and allow the driver to authenticate who they are without necessarily sharing any information, and probably be way more accurate because it's got more robust uh, inputs. Uh, contracting. Well, with smart contracts, we can basically spell out the kinds of terms that we want in a specific agreement. So I need an SUV. It needs to have three rows of seating because I've got my kids with me. And uh, we need to take uh, a toll road because we're late for hockey practice. So all of these different terms can be built into a contract. And then payments, either with cryptocurrencies or stable coins or even with existing payment rails, you can integrate that into the back end. So Uber and Airbnb and others could, could do this, but it also means that others could as well. And there's actually a Toronto-based company, which is part of the Techstars program called Velocia, which full disclosure, I'm an advisor to these guys, um, that's doing exactly this, and it's very exciting. So I won't talk about all eight of those business models. Um, if you want, there are other talks online where I give where I go into this, or you can pick up the book and check it out. Uh, the thing I want to end on is government and democracy. So we're right now in a bit of a crisis of legitimacy in our institutions. Trust in government and trust in many institutions, big companies um, and others, is at an all-time low. And this is deeply problematic uh, because good government is essential to a functioning society and to a working economy. And a lot of people nowadays basically have decided to tune out um, of government. You know, they approve of the bumper sticker, don't vote, it only encourages them. So how can we fix this? The old model of democracy was broadcast. It was, you are a passive citizen, you are inert. Every four years, you go to the polls, you vote, and then you become a recipient of whatever government um, services, propaganda, politics comes your way. The future is going to be one where there is greater transparency and where there is greater interaction. And I believe that one of the core principles of this um, is uh, voting. So the way we vote today is flawed in a lot of respects. Actually, the way we do things in Canada is basically the best system we've developed so far, which is a paper and pencil or a pen. Um, because all these other systems, all these other technologies are vulnerable to hacking or to attack or to fraud. But again, a vote is much like a payment. If you vote, it's important that it's cast, that it's counted for the person you voted for, that it remains anonymous, that it's securely stored, and that it's count only once. The internet, as a digital medium for information, is not good for voting, but blockchain is. So the more people who vote, the more participation there is, the greater enfranchisement, the more legitimate the outcome. And we can help to create um, the conditions for that. I'm not gonna get into this in too much detail, but basically, if you look at many of our institutions, governments, corporations, the media, all the things we know of today, these are institutions that were born of an industrial age. You know, we decided we needed all these things. People were moving to the cities to work in factories. We needed edu an education system. Uh, we needed to prepare people for world wars. So we needed a, you know, um, a social safety net and a healthcare system which ensured they were fit and ready for duty. But these are all institutions that are kind of growing old. And I think in a lot of respects, they're on their last legs. And we have to think about what a new social contract for the digital age means. Now, I'm not saying blockchain is a panacea and that it represents the solution to all of these problems, but it does hold part of the key. Not everyone's convinced, uh, apparently. Um, Warren Buffett called Bitcoin uh, rat poison squared, which is weird because I don't really know how you square rat poison. You figure you got rat poison, that's all you really need to kill the rat. Um, this is a new paradigm. And whenever you have a new paradigm, leaders of the old react with uh, derision, 
with uh, hostility. Um, you know, there's an old saying that first they ignore you, uh, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, and then you win. If you look at the history of technology and, and of new institutions as well, uh, a lot of the time they're met with this kind of uh, feedback. And the fact of the matter is that I think we're on one of these um, precipices. This is like the invention of radio or television um, or any of these other major technologies. So there are lots of reasons to be excited about this. There are also many reasons to be uh, cautious. And I think that's very important. Um, you know, People say that uh, because I wrote a book about this stuff that I'm a futurist. I'm not. I don't believe the future is really something to be predicted. I think it's something to be achieved. And I look into the room here and I see a lot of people, young people uh, and others, who I think can help to achieve that future. And here are some things you need to be aware of. You know, is this technology ready for prime time? If we wanted to move the transactional capacity of the New York Stock Exchange onto a distributed ledger blockchain, could we do it? Or would it actually seize up, shut down? Could we run Uber on Ethereum? I don't think we could right now. Um, how will governments react to this? What kind of policies will they create? What kind of regulations will they um, institute? How will incumbents react? All of these big centralized companies that I've discussed have captured hundreds of billions of dollars of value by being in the middle of every single transaction and every share of information that happens online. So surely they've got um, their own uh, square to protect. Um, what will this mean for the economy, for jobs, for our institutions? So there are lots of things to be concerned about. But you have to ask yourself, are those all reasons that this is a bad idea, that it's not worth our time, or are they implementation challenges to be overcome? And I think in every single one of those examples, they're an implementation challenge. And they need to be overcome because there's an opportunity here to rewrite the economic power grid uh, and the old order of human affairs and maybe fix some big problems like privacy and identity uh, for this new digital age. So I'll end on this. Uh, there's a, an old parable about the invention of chess. And uh, the story goes something like this. The king of the land, he is so pleased with this new game that has brought so much entertainment to his court that he offers the inventor anything he wants, whatever his heart desires, as a reward. And the inventor of chess says, oh, sire, I'm a humble man with humble needs. All I want is some rice to feed my family. But I would like for you to give it to me in this way. One grain on the first piece of the chessboard, two grains on the second piece, four grains on the third, eight grains on the fourth, and so on and so forth. And the king, who I gather is like not a math guy, um, says, sure, whatever. How much rice could that be? A bag of rice, a barrel of rice. Your wish is granted. Of course, eight becomes 16, becomes 32, becomes 64, and so on and so forth. So by halfway through the chessboard, it's more rice than the entire kingdom can produce in a year. And by the end of the chessboard, it's enough rice to cover the whole planet Earth in six feet of rice. There's a, a slight corollary to the story, which is the king gets really pissed off and cuts the guy's head off. Um, that's not going to happen to you, um, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> um, but this is where we're at. So the first you know, digital era, those three cycles I told you about, starting in, with the computer and ending with the internet, they're the first half of the chessboard. The world today is unrecognizable and has grown exponentially in ways that were probably hard to fathom in the 1950s when the first computers were being deployed. So imagine what the second half of the chessboard is going to look like. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, maybe one, one question. I, I'm over time, but I'll, I'll take a question if you have any. Yeah. Um, I think that there are ones that exist today that will be able to, but there aren't any today that can, basically. Any others? Yeah. Uh, so I have a question regarding the concept of a self-sovereign identity. Yeah. Uh, which is sort of in, in a way touched upon other talks. Um, so, and it could be based on a misunderstanding of how blockchain actually works, which is likely a lot of people's platform It's this idea of... Uh, how would self-sovereign identity actually work in the sense that like, everything you do, like your info, things that you buy, to the thing you work to the that all be reported? What? What? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, 
So my, my perspective on this basically is that um, it's not so much about the data itself, it's about the attestation of the information, right? So it's the ability to control uh, a proof that allows you to sh demonstrate who you are in a bunch of interactions. So without having to, so the way it works today, right, is like every time you use a credit card or every time you interact with a website, you are leaving behind a trail of breadcrumbs about yourself. And a lot of the times those, those types of interactions require you to provide information about yourself to authenticate you. So the idea is what if you had one layer abstracted from the original data, just a proof of that data that everyone knew was true and accurate that you could use to access those services. So I'm not suggesting that um, all of the information that exists out there today is about to be pulled back, right? Like the Pandora's box is, is open, so to speak. But the idea is moving forward that individuals be able to access more things online without having to share information about themselves. Um, I think that's a, a pretty worthy cause. And the other thing too is that a lot of that information can be used to improve how we deliver services. So um, I'll give you an example. Like um, two weeks ago, actually, um, my wife and I had our first child. And um, we, uh, Women's College Hospital is our hospital. It's Mount Sinai is the hospital where the delivery was happening. And um, we asked the, the, um, to the doctors in Mount Sinai, you know, will you have the information from um, Women's College about, you know, patient health records and the baby and everything else? And they said, um, we, we typically receive a fax, um, but if not, then we can make a phone call. So they're worried about creating all these duplicate records of personal health information. And Anne talked about the, the real legitimate concerns of having your personal health records existing in many places and being vulnerable to hacking or to attack. So imagine if instead there was a self-sovereign identity that allowed us to share that information with trusted parties without having to necessarily reveal um, all of the underlying sensitive information. Now, I don't know exactly how that would work. I'm not a healthcare professional and I'm not an expert at all in that subject. But the, to think that, you know, for something as, as essential as, you know, the birth of your child, to not necessarily know the information is getting from to and fro, I think is a kind of an egregious thing and, and I think deserves to be fixed. So that's just one example. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody.